first Sunday of Advent, and we're still in November. We're going to be in the book of Genesis this morning, Genesis chapter 3, and I'm just going to read two verses, and it's page, page 3 in your Bible, so the page number corresponds with the chapter number of Genesis, if you're using a pew Bible this morning. We're going to just read verses 14 and 15, but I'll do a synopsis of the whole chapter, or up to verse 15, before we get there. It's verse 14 and 15 of Genesis chapter 3. It says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time of year. We can celebrate the promise you kept so long ago. Lord, and I pray right now that you would come minister to us, guide us, and teach us this morning through what your word has to say. And we pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. So like I said, today is the first Sunday of Advent where we're celebrating the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, something I find interesting is that we on this side of the cross have four weeks of remembrance, right? But before Christ came, they were in a constant state of Advent. They were always looking forward to the coming Messiah. But while they celebrate it in the waiting and in the promise, we, we celebrate in the promise actually being fulfilled. While they looked for the one to come, we look at the one who did come. And now we gather to celebrate that coming of our Messiah. Now, this last week I shared with you an in, in email, um, uh, those who are, who are on the email list, an Advent devotional that was written by my friend and, and pastor in Lewiston, Micah Lang. And he's, he's done an incredible, wonderful job of this, of this Advent season. And it, but it is five days a week. He goes through it. It's, it's Psalm, Scripture, and it, it helps you get your heart ready and to celebrate the coming Messiah. And if you're not on the email list and would like to access that, um, Advent, the free Advent devotional. It's on our website, fbcdexter.com, and you can just download it right there. Um, I'm not going to print it out because it's 69 pages long, so I didn't want to use a ton of paper. Print Just two copies would be a few reams. So we're not going to do that. But you're more than welcome to, to download it, and I find it easy to use on a tablet or on your computer. But for this Advent season that we're in right now, for the times I'm going to be preaching, I have this Sunday and the last, and Jay has the two in the middle. I'm going to share from a couple of passages out of many that point to the coming Messiah, these passages in the, in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament actually contains 300 prophecies that were fulfilled with exactness in Jesus Christ. That's amazing. No other person in history has that many prophecies fulfilled ever. And most of these prophecies were written down more than 500 years before they were even fulfilled. So that's no accident and no coincidence, but it points to that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for, the one the Jews waited for so many years. So today's passage comes after some pretty significant events, right? Some pretty significant events of, of creation and then the first sin, so I'm going to start by kind of putting, going over that, putting that all into context. The first two chapters of Genesis celebrate the creation, right? What the creator has done and humans, right? We are the pinnacle of God's creation made on, on day six. Adam and Eve were the only two humans that ever existed other than Jesus who started off in a perfect, as perfect humans, right? No sin and they lived in a perfect environment. They had, they had everything we would dream of ever having here. With just one rule. There's one rule they had to obey. 
Don't eat of a tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, that's the only rule they had to obey. And we will walk through Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, and see how this is played out. And we'll start off by looking at an uninvited character in the garden, Satan, the serpent, right? Everything is going well until Eve is tempted by the serpent who is controlled by Satan. The devil deceives and he casts doubt in Eve's heart, misquoting what God actually said and implying that he was holding out of them. Like, come on, God's just trying to withhold back everything that's good from you. Right? In verse 1, we see this. He says, Satan tells Eve, did God really say? It's telling that the serpent uses the generic name for God instead of the name used in the first part of the verse. Yahweh Elohim, which speaks of him as the covenant creator. In verse 4 and 5, the serpent boldly slams God's character. Right? So he's, he's, he's just calling him like, yeah, you're the, the God. He's not even pointing to him as the creator right after he created. Secondly, mankind then falls. All humankind falls. As Eve begins to doubt, she also fixates on which is forbidden. Isn't that how, how temptation happens? A little seed thought goes into our mind, and then the more we fixate on it, there's a greater probability we're going to fall into that temptation. Right? She takes off of her eyes off of God's generous provisions and starts to think of only what was prohibited. We see this with King David when he stared at Bathsheba. He had everything he could ever want, but he was fixated on the one thing he couldn't have. We see this in verse 6 with Eve. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Eve first gives in and eats it. Then Adam right there is like, all right, well, she did it. I guess I'll do it too. It's good. So he also eats it. Then it tells us in verse 7, their eyes are opened. So verse 7 describes the shame that immediately overtook them. And followed their sins, says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So because they're suddenly self-conscious, they try to cover their sin and, and their shame. They knew something was wrong. So we're going to cover it. Us humans, we have been trying to manage our sin and shame ever since. We try to cover it. We don't ever walk around telling people all the bad things we've done. We hide that part of our life. Keep it tucked away. So then a relationship is now broken. Their sin and shame have now caused separation, so they try to get as far from God as they can. Verse 8, we see, And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Those living in sin are still today trying to hide from God. Adam and Eve could no longer face each other without closing, and now they dread facing God. They know they've done wrong, their eyes have been opened, and now they dread facing it. They see God searching for them. And I think it's great that even though God knows what they've done, God knows that they're guilty, he still goes looking for them. He's not to strike them down but he's there to offer reconciliation by asking Adam a question. He's giving him the opportunity to come clean. And at verse 9, it says, where are you? Where are you? Like a loving father looking for a child that's in trouble and knows exactly where he is. Come on out. Tell me what you've done. But Adam didn't take the opportunity. You see in verse 10, he instead has, starts to blame game. Adam says that he hid because he was afraid. God then asks a second question in verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? Adam's now really uncomfortable. Now, so God asks another question. Have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? Adam then blames Eve, and then Eve then has the audacity to then blame God. He says, the woman, my wife, 
that you, God, it's your fault, you gave me, she gave me fruit of the tree. She gave me the fruit of the tree. Right? So shame and guilt and being caught can cause us to cast blame. Come on, I'm, I'm not that bad. If, we, if it wasn't for this environment, right? How many people blame their environment, blame how they grew up, blame where they live? Adam and Eve, Eve had a perfect father, lived in a perfect environment, yet they sinned and blamed that environment they lived in. All right? Because there's only one true way to have that peace. But Eve, she also does something similar when she asked. Only she blames the devil for deceiving her, which was correct. But she still gave in, and she finally admits, just like Adam did, yeah, and, and I also ate it. That did happen. So then the punishment comes. But God pronounces a sentence upon Satan in verses 14 to 15, upon the woman in verse 16, and upon Adam in verse 17 to 19. But then the promise of the Savior. Now that we've covered the context of verse 15, let's get into what we're really going to study this morning. We see in verse 15 the very first glimpse of the gospel message and God's statement to Satan here. We get the first pointing to the promise of Christmas when God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Here we see God's grace in seed form. It's being planted. This is the first promise given after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and it's also the first gospel sermon ever preached. Theologians actually call this proto-evangelium, or the first gospel. In Genesis 3, verse 14, God passes judgment on the serpent for his part in the fall of humanity. First, He's cursed above all other animals. Second, the serpent will crawl on his belly forever. Third, he's going to eat dust all the days of his life. God says, eat my dust, Satan, forever. God doesn't ask him what he did or why he did it because the Lord had already judged Satan when he threw him out of heaven, as we can read in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17. God says, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. So Satan is the only one who entered into this story already an evil, sinful being for disobeying God. God already cursed him. So now, let's take a closer look at this prophecy we see in verse 15. And what God said to Satan so this is where the feud begins. It starts right here. God speaks to Satan and says, I will put, to, put enmity between you and the woman. And the word enmity means hostility or animosity and refers to, to malice that leads to violent acts. One translation puts it this way. I will set a feud. A battle is going to begin right now between you and the woman. Another puts it like this. There will be a war. And then the New Living Translation says, you and the woman will be enemies. There's no way around it. That's the curse. You're going to be enemies forever. So you and Satan are now in open combat. But there's also a deeper meaning found in the next phrase, and between your offspring and her offspring. So here is like between your seed and her seed, referring to the generations yet unborn that would trace their heritage back to Eve. But he says, your seed and her seed. So he's saying Satan has a seed as well. Right? And that seed sprouted with when Cain killed Abel and continued to the wicked generations of, of Noah's day, to the pharaohs who opposed Moses and the Canaanites and who mocked Joshua. The seed of Satan hated the prophets and, and murdered them in cold blood. Herod was called the butcher of Bethlehem, and he tried to kill the Christ of Christmas. The scribes and Pharisees opposed him and plotted to take his life. 
And it's noteworthy what Jesus said to these scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. He says, you serpents, points back to Satan, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? This is Jesus saying this. And then Jesus directly confronts them again in John chapter 8, verse 44, where he, when he said, you are, you are of your father the devil, and, you, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan's, Jesus is calling them out as being one of Satan's. The seed of Satan is what they are. Now, what's amazing to me about this, he's saying it to the religious leaders. Jesus didn't say it to the ones in the world that we often say, oh, they're the seeds of Satan. No, he's saying it to the religious leaders of the time. Satan has infiltrated his inner circle, filling the heart of Judas with malignant evil and put thoughts into Peter's mind, which led Jesus to say to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus said that to Peter, his closest disciple. When he was arrested, men stood in line to lie about him. When Pilate offered to release Jesus, the bloodthirsty crowd cried out for Barabbas instead. The seed of Satan scoffed when Jesus was put to death. The offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent have opposed each other continuously across the centuries, and the struggle continues even today and will continue to the end of Satan's time. Revelation 12, 7 says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. The battle rages on and will raise on, rage on till the end. So then we see a small setback that's going to happen in this prophecy. Look at the end of this verse where God says to the serpent, you shall bruise his heel. How many of you here have had, have had heel pain? Anybody? It's hard to walk, right? You put the, a limp in your step. <laughs> or you don't want to walk at all. It's painful. It slows you down. But I don't know of anybody who's died from a bruised heel, right? It hurts, but it won't kill you. So there are at least two implications in, in this phrase. Sometimes it looks like Satan is winning. He has many tools in his arsenal, and he shoots at God's people incessantly. The evil one uses repetitive and excessive blows to, to break us down. Many of you know I, I love running. I do it six days a week, sometimes seven. And sometimes that excessive running, that excessive pounding, bruises parts of my body. <laughs> sometimes I ignore and I keep going. And sometimes I take days of rest to heal, but it is. It's when you have that excessive hitting. It hurts you. My brothers and I, I remember, we, we would sit down and we would do small little punches in each other's arms. Just smell... You do that long enough, and a big black and blue forms. And you're like, ow, that hurts. That's what Satan does. He just keeps hitting, keeps pounding. Next thing you know, you're, you're injured. Right? He does it by excessive discouragement, repetitive criticism, unbridled anger, or by chronic bitterness. Secondly, we see Jesus heal was bruised on the cross, right? The spikes went through his wrist and also through his heels. No doubt Satan thought he had thrown a knockout punch to Jesus, but all he did was strike Jesus in the heel. As painful as it was, that suffering was nothing compared to what Jesus will do to Satan and has begun to do. So thirdly, victory will come. Let's go back one phrase. is he shall bruise your head. The word he refers to a male offspring, and it's in the singular, meaning one man. When Jesus died on the cross, he 
delivered a crushing and bruising blow to Satan. The cross was God's first fatal blow against Satan. Right? It was the payback for the fall. Victory belongs to the offspring of the woman. This is captured in a couple of verses filled with amazing theology from the original carol, Hark the Herald the Angels Sing. That carol was written by Charles Wesley, and two verses eventually were merged together as one by George Whitefield, who also gave us the chorus, Hark the Herald the Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. And we're going to sing these verses four and five combined later on as our closing hymn. But here are the verses separate before they were combined. I'm going to read them to you. Listen to this amazing theology that is written out. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise thy woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. In us. Now display thy saving power. Ruined nature now restore. Now in mystic union join thine to ours and ours to thine. And then the next verse, verse 5. Adam's likeness, Lord, efface. Stamp thy image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Let us thee, the lost, regain. Thee, the life, the inner man. Oh, to all thyself in part, formed in each believing heart. I don't know why that was changed or taken out, but that is amazing theology that points exactly to what Christmas is all about. Satan's skull, skull has been severely injured, but he is now free to roam the earth awaiting his final punishment, his final execution. That explains maybe why his destructive power is, is growing greater in these last days. And 2 Timothy 3.1 tells us this is going to happen. It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And then in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, we see, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. People will depart the faith, it says. Maybe some of you have noticed that. It's happened over the last few years. It continues to happen. Well-known Christians saying, I'm no longer a Christian. Don't call me that. Think of the Hillsong songwriter, Marty Samson, who says, don't call me a Christian anymore. Author Joshua Harris says, I kissed Danny goodbye. He says, I walked away. Don't call me a Christian anymore after he got divorced. A famous Midwest pastor, Pastor Dave Gass, says, I walked away and don't call me a Christian anymore. A person who wrote for Desiring God, Paul Maxwell, he walked away from the faith that says, don't call me a Christian. This shouldn't be shocking to us because the Bible tells us this will happen. But it is a bit heartbreaking that they couldn't finish the race. So let's ponder the phrase, her offspring. Her offspring. The her is very important here because it's interesting because in Hebrew, the male is considered the one who has the seed. I forget, I think many people forget that, that male and female were created equal and it's only man Sin that has pushed females down. And through God, reconciliate everybody, male and female, are equal again. It should happen in the church, in the Christian circles. That should still be lived out. And he does it through the promise here. He raises the woman up. Because elsewhere in the Bible, descent is determined through the male. Children are normally referred to as the offspring of the father, but here we're told that the woman will produce, the woman will produce an offspring without the aid of a man. I love how Galatians 3 verse 16 argues on the basis of the singular use of offspring. It says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. 
The scripture does not say and to seeds. Many people, many, many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So Galatians is arguing with this. And when Jesus was born, he was the offspring of the woman because his conception by the Holy Spirit, there was no male seed. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman. He didn't come in the usual way. He came by means of a miraculous virgin birth. When God wanted to save the world, he didn't send a committee. He sent his son. When God wanted to say, I love you, he wrapped his love note in swaddling clothes. When God wanted to crush Satan, he started in his stable in Bethlehem. In the end, the devil will be destroyed along with those who follow him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 tells us, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So our conclusion for today. The only way to understand some things that happen is by recognizing the fall of man and the enmity between the offspring of the evil one and the offspring of Eve. From the beginning, God said there will be a war between the two, and it rages on even till today. Secondly, the Christian life will be a struggle. Sorry to disappoint you, but it's going to happen. Don't get discouraged because the Christian life isn't easy. Determined to be fully devoted to Christ no matter how hard it gets. That's why these gentlemen walked away. They thought, I did everything right. How could something bad happen to me? God must not be real. Right, you must not be reading the same Bible I am. It's not supposed to be easy. We're at war. Put on the full armor of God. Life is hard. Times are difficult. And the enemy is attacking on every side. Satan is the enemy of our souls as well. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be of sober mind, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. When I was growing up, I had many pastors wrongly teach me the devil doesn't have any teeth, he prowls around. Oh, the devil has teeth. And we'll take a chunk out of you if you're not wearing the full armor of God. Think if the devil was that wimpy, he would have that much power? He hates you. And he would do anything to take you down. I love what Paul writes to per the persecuted believers in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Just to give you hope. Right? Thirdly, when to receive the sacrifice of the Son. There's at least one more picture of salvation found in Genesis 3. We've looked at Satan, sin, shame, seeking. We looked at the squirming, the sentencing. And we looked at the Savior, the promise of the Savior to come. Now, I want you to see the word sacrifice in Genesis 3, verse 21. It says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and close them. Now, this is really important. I think it's often just brushed over and missed because we now wear a lot of garments made out of skin and use it a lot. But Adam and Eve tried their best, right, to cover their sin, their shame with these fig leaves, but they fell apart and they probably knew, needed a new one every day, right? Because people are wearing fig leaves, they dry it pretty quickly. <laughs> you would start showing things again you don't want to show. Right? The same is, is, is true for us, though. If we, if we try to cover ourselves to make ourselves look presentable, we're always going to fall short. Right? It's a task that we can never do once and for all. So God provided garments of skin and clothed them. Only God can provide the covering that we truly need. The emphasis is on God's initiative here as he takes on takes care of their shame. 
Because these coverings were made of skin, we know an animal sacrifice had been made. Can you imagine the horror of Adam and Eve never seen death before this? Probably never seen blood. And they're seeing an innocent animal being killed for the first time because of their sin. God slaughtered an innocent animal to provide a covering for them. In that very moment, they saw firsthand how much their sin really cost. For the first time in history, suffering, sacrifice, and innocent blood is shed so that human sin might be covered and community with God could be restored. This is the foretaste of substitutionary atonement. God is setting the stage for the Passover and later for the death of Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. The message was clear. God can only be approached by a way of sacrifice because our sins have separated us from him. Let me try to pull this all together for you. Christmas is all about how Christ covers our curse by coming to earth taking on flesh and dying on the cross. God was sinned against, and so he provided a sacrifice for sinners. God made coats of skin to cover our, skin, our sin. Jesus is God with skin on. And when we believe and receive the sacrifice of his son, we are covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Another implication of Genesis 3.15 is fleshed out in Hebrews 2.14 when speaking of Jesus we read, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus clearly fulfilled Genesis 3.15. The bruised and broken Messiah destroyed the power of death and the devil. But there's more. By his death, Hebrews 2.15 tells that Jesus came to reverse the curse of the fall. By coming at Christmas and then dying in our place as our sin substitute on the cross, he has freed us from death and the devil and delivered all those who through fear and death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus died in our place to not only defeat death and the devil, he also died to to deliver us. He offers each of us a gift. And that gift, a gift that was wrapped way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. A gift that was the promise of Christmas. A promise that was fulfilled. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we confess that we are sinners, that we will be so lost without you, that we would be headed for the only destination that we can go to, Lord. Eternal damnation. If it wasn't for you fulfilling your promise and sending your son here, Lord, to be born to grow up and eventually be crucified on the cross, Lord, and to rise again three days later. Lord, we won't fully and cannot fully comprehend that sacrifice, but we do know that without it, our relationship with you could not be reconciled, that we could not be redeemed. Lord, I pray that we don't squander it. I pray that as life gets hard, that we will cling closer to you, not look to walk away. Knowing, Lord, that you have defeated death, that you have defeated the devil, knowing that you have conquered sin, that we no longer have to be slaves to sin, Lord, that gives us hope. And knowing that we will spend eternity with you, Give us eternal hope, Lord. 
to Lord as this Advent season begins. Let us remember that. Let us share that with others, those who are still living without you. Let each of us remember we are covered in your blood. And all because of our sin, you made that sacrifice. So we thank you and praise you. And we pray all these things in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. <music>